The chief electoral officer lashed out at the government today. Marc Mérat was reacting to the Conservatives' proposed changes to the Electoral Act. And what really had Mérat riled up most was the not-so-veiled suggestion from the minister in charge that Elections Canada plays favourites. Senior correspondent Terry Maleski explains. Terry. Well, Wendy, the government's new elections bill ran into trouble as soon as the minister responsible basically accused the chief electoral officer of partisan bias. The referee should not be wearing a team jersey. The minister of democratic reform, Pierre Polyèvre, aimed that comment at Marc Mayron, the chief elections officer, who today says it's nonsense. Listen, the only jersey that I think I'm wearing, if we have to carry the analogy, or whatever, uh, I believe is the one with the stripes, white and black. Okay. Yes, what it. I note from this bill is that no longer will the referee be on the ice. Now there is some history between Mehran and the Conservatives. Mehran did reveal publicly that in the last election he got over a thousand complaints from all over the country about deceptive Conservative robocalls. But he's gone after the other parties too and they say he is fair. Mark Mehran has been doing far too good a job as far as the Conservatives are concerned and they're going to try to clip his wings. That's what this bill is about. I think that's part of the Conservative plan to weaken Elections Canada and that's one reason we oppose what they're doing. Not more than three further sitting days. And the resistance only hardened when the government imposed time limits on debate about the new bill. Is that the Conservatives' real idea of a democracy? But the minister says he's giving new powers not to the chief elections officer but to an independent commissioner. We're giving him sharper teeth, a longer reach and a freer hand. Again, Mehran didn't buy that. What worries me, I must say, is whether the commissioner will get the toolbox he needs to do this job. And I'm afraid that I don't see it in the, in the it. act as it's currently read. But the government is pushing it through, even if the irony of imposing time limits on a democratic reform bill is hard to miss. Ditto the fact that the bill would muzzle the chief electoral officer so that next time he wouldn't be allowed to reveal, for example, that he'd had more complaints about robocalls. Joining me now, the Minister of State for Democratic Reform, Pierre Polyevra. Good to, uh, good, to, good to see you. Let's clear up this thing first. The chief electoral officer says he was not consulted on your new bill. You say you did consult him. What is the truth? Did you or did you not consult Elections Canada? I did consult him. We met uh, in August. In fact, the exact date is August 22nd in my office, which, to which I invited him. And I listened carefully to his thoughts for about an hour. Uh, in fact, uh, he spoke at length about his ideas for improving the Elections Act, and uh, he spoke until he had nothing further to say. I told him if he thought of anything else, he should give me a call. I've also thoroughly studied uh, his testimony before the, par the local the parliamentary committee, uh, and uh, the, read his uh, many uh, reports, uh, and, you know, 38 of his recommendations have found their way into the Fair Elections Act. So I've carefully listened and included mm -hmm. the best of his ideas. You, you and I both know that even when you talk to other former Elections Canada, uh, uh, head of Elections Canada, they say that's not a consultation, that's a meeting. A consultation is when you give them a draft of your bill and you go over it. And that's a serious consultation. That's not a kind of a pre-meeting to uh, swap thoughts. He is, uh, I invited him and his officials to have a full technical briefing of every aspect of the bill today, and I look forward to hearing his thoughts. Last March, Elections Canada released some recommendations in the wake of the robocall scandal. Here's one of the things they hoped would be in the bill, and they said, quote, in order to increase transparency, it is recommended that upon request of the chief electoral officer, political parties be required to produce all documents necessary to ensure compliance with uh, Canada Elections Act. In other words, they wanted um, the ability to compel parties to open their books. Why did you reject that? Well, there are two separate functions. One is Election Canada's role of administering elections. And election, the, the, that agency will continue with that function. At the same time, there's the function of law enforcement. And we have a law enforcement watchdog known as the commissioner. We're going to give him sharper teeth, a longer reach, and a freer hand. Now, um, sharper teeth mean there'll be tougher penalties for existing offenses. Longer reach means that he'll have more offenses to enforce to protect Canadians against 
voter fraud or illegal big money contributions. Um, and uh, he will have the power to ask a judge to, for the, the, the parties to produce documents uh, in the event of an investigation. And uh, we have a very well-respected judiciary in this country that can uh, rule on whether or not that request is reasonable. But, you know, they even before you made these changes, um, you know, people could already, there was a law that said people could already go to prison and it had just never been enforced before. Um, so now you get to the, you say, tougher penalties. You know, the NDP had a bill, they wanted $500,000 penalties. Elections Canada recommended $250,000. you have recommended 50000 why so little? Well, actually, for some of the offenses that we've created in this act, there's actually prison time provisions. So, and we've created... But there uh, was already prison time. And that, that's my point. You, you, could, you could have gone to prison even before those changes. In some cases, yes. Uh, in some cases, no. Let me give you one example. Example, Evan. Right now, in the Canada Elections Act, it is not explicitly against the law to impersonate an elections official. So you could you know, claim that you represent Elections Canada or uh, another campaign of which you're not a part, even if you don't, and there would be there's no explicit offense to punish such a deed. With the Fair Elections Act, there will be an offense for that kind of action, and it will c come with jail time if the judge so decides. So that, that is an example of the sharper teeth and longer reach that the act will give our uh, a watchdog. Let's talk about robocalls. Uh, one provision in this bill says you got to keep the script to the robocalls for a year. But the yes. current robocalls investigation has gone on for more than a year. Uh, why not, A, extend that, number one, and number two, would this new, if this is passed, would this have actually stopped the robocall scandal? Well, okay, to answer your first question, why not more than a year? First of all, you have to keep in mind, it's hard to uh, appreciate this sometimes, but a lot of the people who are actually doing automated calls are community volunteers who work for local campaigns. They're trying to sell tickets to a, a pancake breakfast to raise funds or get voters out for a local rally. And we want to balance that poli legitimate political activism uh, against the necessity to impose un, uh, you know, rules on, on volunteers of the, that, that they might find hard to, to to, uh, to sustain red tape, for example. What the bill says is keep that script for a year. If there's a problem with your robocall, somebody's going to find out about it well before a year runs out because these calls go out to a large number of people and they're automatic. And so the investigators can look at the scripts. It's an offense not to keep them. And they can also look at the registry that the CRTC will manage to see uh, all the data re related to the call. All right. Uh the other issue that you've done here is you have moved the elections commissioner out from the office of the, um, the uh, chief electoral officer and under the Department of Public Prosecutions. The NDP have said, OK, uh, you have just fixed. Uh, that's a solution where there is no problem. In other words, it doesn't really make much of a difference. Why? What is the difference there? What problem are you solving? As I said earlier, the commissioner uh, is the law enforcement watchdog. We want to give him sharper teeth, a longer reach, and a freer hand. A freer hand means independence. Right now, the commissioner does not control his, uh, legally control his own staff, his own budget, or, and his, someone else inve directs his investigations. He can also be fired at any time. Uh, we're changing all of those things by giving him control of his staff, his investigations, and a fixed term to ensure he cannot be fired without, without cause. Those are the precepts of independence that we are instilling with the Fair Elections Act. Okay, uh, let me just quickly switch to the other issue because since you are the Minister of State for Democratic Reform, let, let me talk about your reaction to the RCMP uh, moving charges of fraud and breach of trust against former Liberal Senator Mac Harb and former Conservative Senator Patrick Brazo. Uh, given these charges, and there may be more charges coming, have, has your party thought uh, any more about ditching your Conservative Senators the way Mr. Trudeau has ditched his senators. Well, uh, you know what, we uh, obviously believe that anybody who has broken the law should be held accountable, and we commend the RCMP for doing its job, uh, and uh, look forward to, to hearing the outcome of those proceedings. As to the, uh, the Senate in general, we've made it clear we believe the Senate should be elected. Uh, it should not be a house of elites where um, unelected, unaccountable 
politicians block the legislation of democratically elected members of the House of Commons. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why I disagree with Mr. Trudeau's approach, uh, his proposed idea of creating a new committee that would uh, decide who could be in the Senate. Uh, that would make, uh, that would allow not only senators to continue to be unelected, but those who appoint senators would also be unelected, which is two steps from democracy rather than just one. But, you know, you and I spoke earlier on CBC Radio as the House, and you called senators hacks, I guess, right? Um, but I just wonder, how does the government then continue to, you know, you do have conservative senators, people like Senator Irving Gerstein, who raises millions of dollars as the chief party fundraiser, he's a senator. Uh, why not cut them loose so you stop having senators working not only in the Senate but to raise money for political parties? Because it's, uh, it would be an unnecessary cheap political stunt. Uh, right now, if you go to the election, to the well, it, would, me, might, it might be expensive political stunt, maybe be because it might cost you some fundraisers. No. <laughs> in fact, if you go right now to the Parliament of Canada website and look up the composition of the existing Senate, you find there are two or three independent senators. There's just roughly 50 conservative senators and 32 liberal senators. That's to this day, and that is not a mistake. They are still liberal but that, senators. I, I agree so on, the, on the website. Me, I've looked but, on the website. You're absolutely right. But, but they, they call themselves liberals. This is not okay, but an they, administrative matter. But they're not matter. working, but to be fair, okay. they're not out there working for the party. You've, you know, they're different than Irving Gerstein as an example. He's a conservative senator who's the head of the Conservative Party Fund, raising millions of dollars for the Conservative Party. Justin Trudeau won't do that for those so-called now senators who call themselves liberal. They can't do that. Would you, what's wrong with that? Listen, a legitimate uh, political activism is not the problem with the Senate. The problem with the Senate is it's not elected. And Mr. Trudeau pr proposes to further embed the undemocratic nature of the, the upper chamber into the Canadian system by making it appointed by unelected people. And just think about one thing here. We have two Houses of Parliament, the House of Commons, right there, and the Senate. Each of them have roughly equal legislative powers. One of them, this House, is picked by 25 million eligible voters. The other, the Senate, under Mr. Trudeau's proposal, would be, would be picked by about 25 members of his selection committee. I, I, so each one I, of those, if I could just finish my thought, each one of his committee members would, be, would have the power of a million voters. That is a new kind of triple E Senate, uh, Evan, it, by the elites, for the elites, of the elites, and we'll have no part of it. Okay, I, and I, I get it, but you, I, you all have no part of what he's done, I understand. Yeah. But nonetheless, after eight years in power, and you're the Minister of State for Democratic Reform, you brought out this interesting bill today on election reform, nonetheless, your party still has senators who are out there, I don't know how they divide their time up, raising millions and millions of dollars for your party. Doesn't that, after you're hacking away at their reputation, calling them hacks, doesn't that strike you as a bit ironic that at the same time that you're undermining their credibility, you rely on them to fund your party? Does that not strike you as a bit ironic? Look, the selection of senators under the status quo is unacceptable. And that is why we've asked the Supreme Court for a legal instruction manual on how we can make senators either elected or how we can abolish the upper chamber altogether. We look forward to hearing back from the top court on those questions and we'll act when we do.